Good morning. Can we resume the conference? We had an excellent first session there, and I know that the quality of the speakers we have for this next session on Salafi jihadi threats will mean that the standard continues at that very high level. It's a real pleasure in principle for me to, pleasure and privilege for me to introduce our two speakers, uh, Mary Haybeck, who teaches here at Georgetown, but also at Johns Hopkins, has a very strong biography, which is in the handbook there, and you'll know it. But she has a PhD from Yale University. Yale University Press also published her influential book, uh, Knowing the Enemy, in 2005. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Mary as our first speaker. Our second speaker, Amy Sturm, is also a very distinguished expert in this field, also teaches here at Georgetown, where she's adjunct faculty. She's pursuing a PhD at the University of Maryland, has a master's from Georgetown, and is also a research fellow at the National Intelligence University. So for two very distinguished speakers, each of them is going to preach for 20 minutes uh, on the subject of Salafi jihadi threats, but both preachers have decided to avoid the pulpit. So they're going to sit here and speak from the platform. Uh, and then after two 20 minute talks, we'll again go to questions and look forward to that. And so it's a real pleasure now to hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Mary Haybeck. Mary. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, what I'm hoping to do is provide the, a sort of overview of the problem that we're confronting and perhaps a slightly controversial uh, way of understanding it um, that I hope will provoke um, some conversation and discussion about this issue. And uh, the controversy, I think, is coming, though, however, uh, almost entirely from the side of the United States. It's um, my understanding from conversations with colleagues uh, from other countries that this is a problem that the United States has mm -hmm. and that most other countries don't share it. So uh, for those who are from the UK or elsewhere, um, perhaps you've been introduced to this problem that the United States has and this will not seem controversial to you at all. Um, <clears throat> but for those of you who are from the US, I think it will uh, be controversial. So the big question is why has um, the threat situation uh, when it comes to terrorism and insurgency uh, gotten so much worse um, over the past at least nine years. In 2011, we were in a pretty good place when it came to these issues. And if you looked around the greater Middle East especially, since we're only going to be talking about uh, jihadi Salafism, there, was, um, uh, there were four countries that were suffering from insurgency and uh, about half a dozen that were suffering from serious terrorism problems. That's hundreds of attacks a year. We're not talking you know, a few um, assassinations or things like this, but hundreds of attacks a year, about six. Um, <clears throat> if you take a look around that same area, you have to actually broaden your scope uh, to talk about jihadi Salafism as a, a threat. And we're now talking about places as far south as Mozambique. And we're looking um, as far you know, west as obviously the Philippines, which back in the day was not really a, a big issue, uh, but it's becoming slowly more and more of one. And Indonesia, which seemed as if it was completely under control, has now got a very serious um, problem building um, underneath the surface. So from Morocco all the way over to there, you're talking about 15 to 17 countries that are suffering from insurgency um, that has some sort of ISIS or Al Qaeda. Um, uh, in mix with it, and um, about the same number of places that are suffering from serious terrorism problems. So we're talking about a problem that is just, uh, I hate to use this term, but exploded over the past um, nine years. And the question is why? What is going on here that um, this has got to be so much worse? And by the way, why is this not discussed in the US media at all? And if you ask uh, people in the United States, uh, so what do you think about the threat from Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda influenced groups? The response is, are they even a thing anymore? I've literally gotten that uh, response from people. ISIS, yes, um, but in, you know, aren't they defeated, you know, or at least on the run or something? Um, whereas uh, Al Qaeda, bit, not even an issue anymore, at least as far as the US um, public and a lot of people who study even the region don't think this is a big issue any longer. And in fact, I just um, read an article in which they were talking about the fact that, oh, Al Qaeda is so much less of a threat. There's been a decline in violence from Al Qaeda. Um, um, so therefore, they're not really a problem. 
So there's a whole set of usual explanations. If you ask people around this town, hey, why has this become such an issue and this is, you know, had this growth in violence over this time? Mm -hmm. And they'll say things like, well, the Arab Spring, obviously. You know, January 2011, if you date the, the sort of time frame, uh, obviously the Arab Spring. The failure of local governments to deal with their own problems. That's something that the um, US and US public are really focusing on. People in the region should reform themselves and deal with their own issues. They shouldn't be dependent on us. Uh, the failure, though, of coalitions of local governments, and by the way, outside actors, um, very competent outside actors, like, for instance, France, uh, to deal with this problem is sometimes pointed out by others, and they're like, well, you know, they're just using the wrong technique or something. Uh, let's not leave out the U.S., though. How about the failure of the U.S. to uh, come to some sort of definitive solution uh, to this problem throughout the greater Middle East? Um, and other people are like, well, this has nothing really to do with uh, outside actors or governments. Or anything. These are internal societal fissures, and uh, <coughs> the uh, extremists are just taking advantage of it. And, but it doesn't explain why 2011, but... Um, you know, you can't deny that Somalia was suffering from a lot of problems before uh, the extremists showed up, and it's probably going to suffer from a lot of problems after the extremists go away, right? Um, <clears throat> then other people are like, well, the U.S. withdrew in 2011 from this region, and this, you know, allowed things to spiral out of control, at least in Iraq and Syria, um, Afghanistan. That explains what's, well, it doesn't explain, obviously, places like northern Nigeria, which also happened to spiral out of control at a precisely the same time. So what's missing from these discussions and what I attempt to add to all the conversations I'm having with folks inside the government and outside about this problem is, of course, what's the enemy been doing? Um, what have uh, jihadi Salafists been doing uh, during this time frame? Um, most people aren't aware of what they're doing. Uh, it's completely off their sort of scope. And they haven't been asking themselves, what are their plans? What do they think um, they're hoping? What are they hoping to achieve? What are their objectives? Um, what, did, what did they start doing after 2011 that was different um, that might help to explain why they went from what looks like uh, to outsiders and especially people in the U.S. to a, um, a crippling blow, right? The death of the founder of the group and, by the way, his second uh, deputy and, um, you know, all sorts of other things that, if, that went on in 2011 that seemed to suggest we were, you know, in a very good place. Right, at least to Americans. I was just mentioning that I've taught a class at SICE for the past, well, since I've, I've been there in 2005. 20 to 25 students take my class on this issue. It's gone through five different names, which suggests something, right? You know, war on terror, global war on terror, the long war, the war, you name it. I've had to switch the name around in order to get students, you know, sort of like this is what it's currently understood as. And um, in 2012, however, I had five students. They all told me, you know, people I was talking to were thinking about, oh, it's not even a problem, it's not an issue anymore. We're doing a pivot to Asia, right? We don't need to worry about that, um, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, people weren't paying attention to it then, and frankly, until 2014, 2015, they didn't start paying attention to it um, at all, when suddenly ISIS apparently came out of nowhere. So we, were, we took our eyes off the ball in the United States. We weren't paying attention to what was going on. And uh, there's something else, however, going on, too. And that is, in my opinion, the US has um, incorrectly defined the enemy we're confronting in two key ways that have major policy and uh, strategic implications. Uh, the first way that we're having trouble understanding the enemy is organizationally, and then secondly, as uh, fighting groups, as combat groups. So <clears throat> if you um, hang out in this town for any length of time, you're going to um, eventually perhaps get around to reading the 2011 National Strategy for uh, Combating Terrorism, which is a key document for understanding how the U.S. even today uh, defines al-Qaeda um, as a, an extremist group uh, organizationally. And what it says is there's actually three groups that we have to worry about, three groups of people. There's a terrorist core that's actually what is meant by the U.S. government when they use the term al-Qaeda. There is a, a bunch of these affiliates out there, which is not what the US means when they use the term Al-Qaeda, um, that have some sort of relationship. They're kind of inspired by Al-Qaeda, but they're, they're not really organizationally part of the group. And then you have these adherents that are just these kind of like inspired individuals, what everybody else calls lone wolves or lone jihadis, right? And they have no organizational ties at all. Okay, this is a very convenient definition for the United States because it implies three separate strategies, none of which mean boots on the ground. It implies that you can uh, get rid of the terrorist core through uh, droning, 
that you can uh, deal with the insurgencies out there in the rest of the world um, by putting others forward and training others and empowering them, making, building capacity. Okay, here's a question for those of you in the audience who might have been involved with this. We've been building capacity in some of these countries for decades now. Which country that lacked capacity before we started doing this now has the capacity to deal with their terrorism and or insurgency problem? And the answer is none. The ones that we've managed to build capacity in, like let's say Indonesia, already had quite a bit of capacity to work with. None of the other countries that we've been working with for decades have we managed to build capacity. But anyway, moving on. Then there's the third group, which is obviously a law enforcement, intelligence law enforcement problem. And you, you know, the FBI and so on and so forth can deal with this problem. We don't really have to engage uh, with the military. It's a great definition, right? The only problem is there's a, a definition out there that has uh, nothing to do with this definition. Um, that's, in fact, the opposite of it. Completely contradicts it. Uh, and that is the definition that Al-Qaeda has of itself. So how does Al-Qaeda, and I'm not talking about ISIS here because actually there's no argument in the US about what ISIS is. Everybody agrees ISIS is um, this thing that calls itself the caliphate with a, ca a caliph and people around him, most of the Muhabarat guys. And then uh, they have these places that they claim provinces they have more or less control of. Nobody disagrees about that at all. There's actually no argument. But the argument, though, is with Al-Qaeda. What is Al-Qaeda? And uh, Al-Qaeda itself defines itself very differently. Al-Qaeda says we consist of two parts, a high command or a general command, depending on how you, you look at it, that's someplace located off there in Afghanistan, Pakistan, or possibly in Syria and elsewhere, according to DNI Clapper. And then a um, field armies that are sort of their co-coms that also have political functions as well as military functions. And uh, these uh, so-called Aqalim have, or regions, have um, you know, defined borders. I've actually uh, managed to look through their, their writings over the past two decades. And you can see how they define the borders for these Aqalim. <clears throat> That's the, the, the way they define it. And they say, uh, the guys in the high command are the, uh, you know, the command structure. And uh, the other guys are their field armies and their soldiers. And they, they do whatever we tell them to do. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, you can, you can claim anything you want to, Al-Qaeda. You, know, you can claim to be emperor of China. It doesn't mean that you actually are, right? Um, but uh, it's actually not just the central command that says this. It is also every single one of these so-called local affiliates. Every single one of them, the leaders of these, have uh, made public statements in which they say, we are the soldiers of this central uh, command and we follow their orders. They tell us what to do and we do whatever they want. You can go online, you can find a 45 minute discussion of this by the guy who is the head of Sharia for Jabhat al Nusra. And in 2014, he gave a 45 minute uh, discussion about the relationship between these Aqalim and the high command, in which he was very clear about it, and the fact that ISIS had broken away from their um, oaths of fealty and were out of the hierarchy and were, uh, in fact, being. Uh, treated as foreigners and strangers now because of this, but they had broken their um, oaths and uh, therefore uh, could be the subject of sanctions. Uh, they were the only ones, by the way, who broke away um, from this structure, this hierarchical structure that Al-Qaeda claims to be in charge of. Now, this is a very inconvenient definition because it suggests that you cannot break it up into three convenient things that do not involve boots on the ground in order to deal with it. It suggests the fact that you have to be involved regionally, that you can't um, pay attention to our borders, our, the international borders, in order to deal with this problem, that you have to go across this, or you have to think of it in terms of their AORs, and you're not going to be able to deal with it just by uh, droning people, or depending on local um, uh, leaders and, and governments that have already shown themselves incapable of dealing with this as the problem has spread, especially since 2011. Um, <clears throat> but that's just one of the problems the United States is having, right? The second problem we're having is, what are we actually dealing with? Is this actually a terrorism problem? And here's where the little bit of controversy comes in because this is a conference on terrorism, right? Um, or is this an insurgency problem we're dealing with, right? Um, now, I, you know, just from a kind of, you know, 
saying those terms doesn't mean that you can prove one or the other, right? Um, there's all sorts of definitions for terrorism. The United Nations can't agree on what uh, you know, terrorism is, let alone anybody. If we all got together and, and created one of the definitions I've seen out there, you'd end up with exactly the same thing. This like unmanageable paragraph of like gobbledygook, and you'd be like, Ugh. this is what coordination does for you. I worked in the NSC staff for a year. Uh, the interagency, the death of all good ideas. So anyway, um, uh, there was, uh, so terrorism, you know, there's a lot of problematic things about it. But uh, insurgency, most everybody agrees what you're dealing with there, right? It's um, the, the end spectrum of irregular warfare, and it's the kind of thing that uh, nobody wants to hear that they have. It's sort of like hearing you have cancer, having an insurgency, right? You, you get these symptoms, and you're thinking, no, it's terrorism. It's got to be terrorism. It can't be insurgency. <laughs> Why? Well, because terrorism, you know, if you, you look at the, the, the definitions that uh, a lot of people use, like Audrey Cronin or other, suggest that they're small, secretive, they can't, you know, recruit enough in order to replace themselves. They, they aren't big enough in order to control territory, not big enough in order to uh, impose a vision of governance. And there's some other things that go along with this. But the, the main thing is they use terrorism as their main or or only tactic in order to achieve their political ends, right? And, uh, but for the purposes of policy and for dealing with them, the important thing is, is their size and the fact that they can't recruit enough because that means you can actually use intelligence, law enforcement, and attrition in order to deal with it. And you, know, you can kill and capture an insurgency group to death. And it's, it's happened repeatedly. As I said, Audrey Cronin has done the, um, the social science on this. I'm, I am not a social scientist despite how some people define history. And, uh, but she has done uh, the hard work, and she's shown multiple, multiple groups that have been dealt with using those simple, uh, uh, easy uh, to do um, techniques, right? Well, they're simple and easy compared to insurgency, because insurgent groups are um, obviously far larger. They recruit more widely. They are big enough to do things like um, hold territory, impose a vision of governance. And while they do use terrorism sometimes as a, a tactic, they basically focus on you know, some form of guerrilla warfare, right? More complex forms of warfare, right? That's an insurgency for you. And compared to terrorism, uh, far more difficult and uh, uncertain uh, techniques for dealing with it, right? Counterinsurgency means anything you do to counter an insurgency, and there's all sorts of ideas about how this should be done. In the United States, especially in the military, there's this vision you know, of clear hold build as being the right way forward, and everybody points to the surge and what was done on a limited scale in Afghanistan as the, a way of understanding you know, a successful technique for dealing with this problem. But if you do the social science, as Rand did, and uh, Seth Jones, uh, what you come up with is um, a much messier picture, right? 25% of all insurgencies end with victory, complete victory for the insurgents. 25%, and I'm rounding, um, it, it turn out to have full victory by the government side or the counterinsurgents, and 50%, everybody gets something. So this is why I compare it to having cancer. Because you have the same kind of uncertain outcome. And therefore, a lot of people would just as soon not hear that they have insurgency any more than they want to hear that you have cancer. Rumsfeld is a great example of this. When he was in office, you couldn't use the term insurgency to talk about uh, Iraq for that very reason. Lots of people are like that today. They don't want to talk about those insurgencies out there as being anything to do with us, the United States, with Britain, France, Germany, or elsewhere, those are local problems, local insurgencies that have nothing to do with us. But what is really going on with Al Qaeda? How do we, what are the data points we have to suggest whether Al Qaeda sees itself as a terrorist group or as an insurgency? Well, there's three uh, data points that I've put forward for you, some of them from Al Qaeda and some of them from what we've been doing in order to uh, deal with this issue. So, first and foremost is, um, Al Qaeda has a strategic plan called the Minhaj, short for short, the methodology Menhaj, depending on you know which version of Arabic, and uh, this uh, Menhaj has um, lots of things uh, that are interesting about it. But uh, the big thing is it's based on uh, primarily, or at least overtly, the life of Muhammad, and it has stages just like the life of Muhammad has, according to the Sira, and it um, works through these stages. Uh, in a very um, sort of religiously 
um, relevant way, at least this is the way they think about it, and legal is how they actually think about it, legitimately, um, legitimate way. Um, and that sort of makes sense, right? The, they claim to be a religious group. They claim to have some sort of relationship with uh, Islam and that they would have a, um, a strategy that's based on uh, the life of Muhammad uh, sort of makes sense, right? Uh, but actually, uh, what they're training their troops in, the military political strategy that comes off of this is straight up Mao. It's straight up Mao, or Jap, depending you know, on who you look at. Because uh, Ilyas Kashmiri, who is one of their military geniuses, actually loved uh, Jap. He wrote his master's thesis on him and uh, predicated the work that he did, at least on the Minhaj, uh, based on Jap. Because it was, he said, the, the only people who defeated the United States were the Vietnamese, and we're going to copy them. right? So if you take a look at the Minhaj, and we now have copies of this uh, because of the Abbottabad documents, it's straight up Mao. It starts off with what they call the covert jihad, you know, creating the group, um, secretly carrying out assassinations and not claiming them, like they did throughout the 1990s, like they did in Tunisia, like they do in a lot of places. And then when you get caught out and people you know, come after you, you've put aside um, a safe haven, you've been training people in camps that you're not claiming, and everybody's got the, the, the necessary tools to begin what they call the defensive um, jihad or um, the strategic defense of some, sometimes. And that's uh, predicated uh, on nothing but guerrilla warfare. And that's what they trained people at uh, for all those years in the 1990s. Because it turns out we had it wrong in the 1990s as well. They were not training people in terrorism in the 1990s either. They were training them according to this minhaj. We have copies of the training manuals they were using in the 1990s. And those tens of thousands that were trained were trained in guerrilla warfare. Uh, to go back and start uh, implementing the Minha channel on an individual basis throughout all these countries. And um, after you have sufficiently weakened the central government so that they withdraw from the territory you want, then you begin what's called equilibrium. And equilibrium is predicated upon creating the institutions of governance in order to create a state eventually. And whenever you have a state ready to go and you also have a regular army that you believe can take on the enemy on a one-to-one -one basis, you start the strategic offensive, which is about taking the capital city. And that's basically what we saw in Iraq and Syria um, in 2014 and 2015 was the strategic offensive after the declaration of the state. That's, that's straight up Minhaj. Um, that ISIS is well used. And it's the same kind of thing that we saw in Afghanistan at precisely the same time. So according to Al Qaeda, what they're doing is guerrilla warfare. It has nothing to do, in fact, with what we think of as terrorism. In addition, this is my last point. <laughs> I told him I was going to talk twice as fast so I could fit twice as much material into 20 minutes. Um, if you take a look at, uh, I'm not going to give all three points, but the second point would be, uh, take a look at what has actually been happening as we've used attrition in order to deal with this problem. Um, we've had the kind of uh, result that one would expect in trying to use attrition against an insurgency rather than terrorism. Because as Audrey Cronin points out, attrition really works. And she, as I said, has the data. And she's not the only one who's pointed this out. There's lots of people who've been doing this work and shown. Um, attrition works. Kill capture actually works when it comes to attrition groups or to terrorism groups. Um, in uh, 2010, Mike Lader, uh, the head of NCTC in the United States, gave an interview in which he said, um, there are three to 500 members of Al-Qaeda left. And remember, Al-Qaeda for that administration and for, the, and for this one, as far as I can tell, means the terrorist core. Three to 500 members of Al-Qaeda left. Um, you know, once they're gone, that's going to be the end of the group. All right. 2016, August of 2016, there was a FOIA request for the data on how many members of Al Qaeda had actually been killed uh, by uh, droning. Um, and uh, the real purpose of it was to figure out how many civilians had been killed by droning, but it also showed this. And um, I have a friend named Bill Raggio who does this um, for combat areas. This was for non combat areas. So by putting them together, you can say how many of these three to 500 were actually killed by droning. Uh, from 2010 at least, maybe even a little before that, through 2016. 5,000. So we overfulfilled the plan. This suggests they can indeed replace themselves, which suggests it's not really a terrorist group that we're dealing with. They're, they're far bigger. They're far more flexible and resilient, by the way. 
Um, our droning made them just uh, set up, you know, apparently at least two deputies for every person in charge. Um, as I said, we, we managed to get uh, bin Laden, but um, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, um, we know from interviews with Abu Yunus al-Muritani, was in fact uh, the second deputy. And, uh, the first deputy, Zawahiri, got away and the whole system was resilient and flexed, the organization not affected at all about what we thought was a killing blow. What we thought was going to lead to a splintering of the group, in fact, from 2011 to today, has led to a doubling, tripling mm -hmm. of the problem. Thank you. Mary, thank you very much indeed. A pleasure now to hand over to our second speaker for the session, Amy Sturm. Amy. Thank you so much, Dr. English. Um, and thank you to um, first, Mary, for your groundbreaking work in this field, um, Dr. English um, for your work on terrorism and political violence, and Dr. Hoffman um, and Dr. Wilson for the invite to appear here, as well as to St. Andrews and to my alma mater, Georgetown. It's truly an honor to be here among you all and to share the ambiguous and rather daunting task of characterizing the nature of Salafi Jihadi threats at the beginning of a new decade, nearly 20 years into what we conventionally call the global war on terror, and, near, and over 30 years since Al-Qaeda's founding. As an alumnus of Georgetown's security studies program, who used to attend conferences very much like this, um, let me assure you that that task is even more formidable from my seat. Yet my dual perspectives as a DOD practitioner with operational experience, as well as an academic conducting research on the impact of USCT operations on the measurable impact on foreign terrorist organizations, allows me to put today's context in some, into some broader context. But first, the required caveat. While I'm on an academic fellowship and away from my normal day job, it is important to emphasize that my comments reflect my personal perspective based on my research and are not the official positions of National Intelligence University, nor any part of the Department of Defense or the US government. I begin all of my classes at Georgetown that way, and let me t assure you, it goes over like a lead balloon. But as an analyst, I do think it's important to note that our collective characterization of the threat is likely only as good as today's date. I'm trained to constantly search for missing information, counter narratives, alternative perspectives, and information gaps. The Salafi Jihadist threat, as Mary alluded to, is continually evolving, and academic expectations and predictions over the last two decades have, in almost equal measure, both undersold and overestimated the threat. A difficulty that Bruce alluded to in his opening remarks this morning about the last iteration of this same conference. The truth, as fleeting as it may be, is always somewhere in between. Al-Qaeda is not gone, as Mary so eloquently elucidated, um, but bin Laden is. Baghdadi and his caliphate have been destroyed, but ISIS's history, global influence, and legacy were underestimated as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and we should not overestimate their defeat. Our task this morning, and indeed every day, is to be clear-eyed about the threat, yet not hyperbolic, honest about the resources that have been required to sustain the Allied counterterrorism effort, and realistic that those resources will likely not continue, and measured in any declaration of success or overestimation of failure when terrorists do attack. I teach my students that to enter a career in counterterrorism, one must be incredibly resilient, which seems a fitting word to describe both the Salafi Jihadi threats we face and the character required of the nations facing those threats. The difficult task of quantifying those threats therefore begins with an understanding of exactly how we define threat, conventionally the capability and intent of Salafi Jihadist groups. This classic estimation of military threat is originally credited to a 1958 J. David Singer paper, but was importantly originally threat perception equals estimated capability times estimated intent. For my students in the room, a helpful way to think about the definitions of these two terms, capability and intent, is that, the, is that capability is your capacity for completing your assignments on time, given your resources, while intention is whether or not you plan to take any action towards completing that assignment. My perception, if the professor in this context is the threat, is that both the estimated capability and intent of my students to complete their work is exceptionally high, hence the standards under which they're graded. I regularly witness another example that's illustrated with my two-year-old. She has incredible, forceful intention about everything. Her intent is nearly unlimited. But her capability, given her size, strength, and physical capacity, particularly given I can pick her up and move her, are limited. The threat to her physical safety and anything valuable in the house comes when her parents underestimate her capability. There are no questions about her intentions. Not to compare my two-year-old to terrorists, but the debate in public policy and the academic discourse about the nature of the Salafi Jihadist threat can often confuse capability with intent, or vice versa, and inadvertently focuses on one or the other rather than dealing with them in aggregate. So establishing that equation up front is essential to the task at hand. My colleagues Kim Cragen and Sarah Daly made a similar observation in a 2003 RAND study on terrorist capability, noting that terrorism analysis rarely combines the two across the full range of potential threats, and rather criti criticizes many researchers for not combining the two in their analysis. 
Thus, I will deal with both in turn, specifically related to the Salafi jihadic groups during the next 15 minutes or so to address the central question. First, turning to the estimated capability. In the aforementioned study, Cragen and Daly, in order to compare the capabilities of terrorist groups, divided them into two categories. Activities needed to run a terrorist organization, namely the ideology, leadership, recruitment, pools, and publicity, and the activities needed to launch successful operations, to include command control, weapons, operations, space training, intelligence, et cetera. For the purposes of this discussion, I'll focus on capabilities in much the same terms. Organizational capability, measured specifically by the number of Salafi jihadist organizations and membership estimates worldwide, the global insurgency that Mary alluded to. Um, and I'll also talk about <coughs> operational capability as measured by their collective ability to engage in successful attacks, an admittedly overly broad brushstroke of the current threat, but one that I think can capture the number of groups in the number of locations around the world in the broad brushstroke that were allowed this morning. Let's begin with organizational capability first, starting with the number of organizations we're talking about, their membership, and their global reach. The term Salafi Jihadist, the title of this talk, helps to narrow the aperture a bit, specifically referring in to individuals who desire to return to a pure form of Islam and believe that violent jihad is a religious obligation. Importantly to this discussion, it usually also means advocacy for war of all Muslims against the unbelievers, typically the West, but sometimes the apostate regimes in their local lo locations. This criteria helps to distinguish Sunni political groups from Salafi jihadists and separate the two, and also further delineates groups that specifically target the West. With that definition, it's important to note that not every analyst or researcher counts Salafi jihadi groups in the same way. Mary's classification breakdown of the threat is not the only difference of opinion we have in the community. A 2018 Center for Strategic International Studies report on this evolution of the threat did not specify groups that solely targeted Western interests and was therefore more inclusive of Salafi jihadists than other general estimates. For example, it included traditionally Deobandi groups like the Afghan Taliban. Other depictions from researchers focus on a more globally aligned movement with flexible boundaries and less exacting counts under the competing banners of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. This is not to say that either depiction is correct or incorrect, but rather to raise awareness that even in the established counterterrorism think tank and academic communities, when one says Salafi jihadist threat, that is not necessarily a starting consensus between the speakers on what that term refers to broadly and what specific groups belong under that terminology. Some of that difference is, is due to the difference in the group's intent, which I'll return to later. But for the purposes of this discussion, not all Salafi jihadist threat assessments, including very likely between myself and Mary, are necessarily looking at the same groups at the same time. Despite that important caveat in characterizing the threat, contemporary researchers remain consistently concerned about the number of Salafi jihadi groups and fighters at the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, com com particularly compared to the end of the Afghan jihad and given the global effort to eradicate that threat over the last two decades. Based on my research in the immediate period after September 11th, specifically roughly September 11th to February 2003, there were 11 groups designated by the US as foreign terrorist organizations that could be described as Salafi jihadist. By the end of 2018, that number had increased to 45 groups, or a roughly 309% increase in the pure number of Salafi jihadist organizations of security concern to the United States. Why the specificity on foreign terrorist organizations? The answer in my count is, the, is exactly because of the combination of capability and intent. For background, since 1997, the US government has formally declared foreign terrorist organizations via an interagency process under the legal authority of the Secretary of State. By law, FTOs must be first, foreign, Second, engaged in terrorist activity or retain the capability to engage in terrorism. And three, their terrorist activities must threaten the security of the United States citizens or the national security of the United States. In practice, FTOs must be validated by the whole of the US government, including Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, the Intel community, the Department of Justice, the National Security Council, and the Department of Treasury. While FTO designation is not the only listing tool used by the US government, it is, to quote Ardrey Kurth Cornyn once again, a recognized point of lucidity in the often complicated interagency process of coordinating the actions of executive agencies by giving them a central focal point upon which their efforts should converge. FTO designation essentially validates that the US government believes an organization has both the capability and the intent to threaten the United States. But that's not the only way to count. Counting by a different method, the, CIA, the aforementioned CSIS report indicated that there were 67 Salafi jihadist groups across the globe in 2018, tied with 2016 for the highest level since, since 1980. This reflects a 180% increase in the number of groups from 2001 to 2018. Whether the increase is over 300% or nearly 200%, the bottom line is the numbers are getting worse. One could argue that the multiplication of groups is due to the increasing localization of a global phenomenon, Ironically, one of, the bold, one of the goals of the first Bush counterterrorism strategy, and one of the goals of many counterterrorism strategies since, except that the number of fighters under those banners has also grown exponentially. 
The Islamic State is widely reported to have attracted well over 40,000 fighters from at least 110 countries during its heyday, just in Iraq and Syria. Compared to the 170 core al-Qaeda members in 2002, we now know bin Laden counted among his members from the Abbottabad documents. That number is staggering. CSIS estimates put the number of geographically dispersed Salafi jihadists in the low 100,000s as the most conservative estimate of the current threat. And CIS noted in their report that the number of groups are at the highest level in the past 40 years and that present day counts are 270% greater than in 2001. While other groups have taken issue with CIS's count, as any, study, stu any student of military strategy would note, no matter how you count the groups, there are simply more Salafi jihadist organizations established around the world under the competing banners of Al Qaeda and ISIS and their affiliates than one would have predicted two decades ago, given the tremendous global effort to eradicate this threat. Capability, however, is not just the number of Salafi jihadi fighters or aspirants. It's also their operational capability to engage in terrorist activity. The capacity I'm most concerned about is their ability to engage in successful operations, now largely defined, though not exclusively confined to, their ability to kill people, or lethality. After September 11th, Brian Michael Jenkins very famously revised his terrorists want a lot of people watching and a lot of people listening, but not a lot of people dead, to Salafi jihadist groups and their affiliates want a lot of people watching and a lot of people dead. And this is borne out in the literature. A study from the criminology field on the frequency and lethality of attacks appearing in the journal Homicide in 2018 concluded that incidents affiliated with the global jihadist movement, largely but not uniformly overlapping the aforementioned Salafi jihadist groups, are simply more lethal with a higher casualty count. As Bruce suggested inside terrorism, this trend is largely due to the growth of Islamic suicide attacks, particularly between 2005 to 2015, when 907 suicide attacks reached 25 countries, a doubling of instances of suicide terrorism and their geographic reach in a mere decade. Now for some good news, not to depress the room too much. The data also indicates that perplexingly, the United States and Western Europe have experienced a sharp decline in the total number of terrorist attacks on US soil since the 1970s. And that Salafi jihadist threats have largely been inspired by an independent hierarchy, independent from the hierarchy that Mary described earlier, accounting for roughly one to 2% of attacks um, globally in terms of terrorism since. That number should not, however, belied the tremendous effort by the US, UK, and allied intelligence and security law enforcement services post September 11th to make September 11th a statistical aberration. We should not underestimate how much effort has gone into ensuring an event of that magnitude has thus far never been repeated on US soil. Absence of a, of a large mass casualty successful attack in the United States should never be confused with a change in Salafi jihadist intent. Either it, it is more likely evidence of the tremendous resources and level of effort that has been put forward to diminish the operational capacity against the US and Western allies of Al Qaeda, ISIS, and its affiliates. In light of that stark warning, global trends tell a very much less optimistic story. The growth of Salafi jihadist groups, the, the insurgency Mary mentioned, and fighters has been accompanied over the last two decades with an exponential increase in terrorist violence worldwide, which peaked in 2014 before slowly beginning a slight downward slope. Gary LaFree, the founding director of the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, points out that from 2002 to 2014, worldwide terrorist attacks increased 12-fold, while fatalities caused by terrorists and the Salafi jihadist groups in Middle East, India, Pakistan, and Nigeria increased by more than eight times their 2002 totals, trends largely driven by the groups we're talking about. In the latest edition of University of Maryland's annual Peace and Conflict Summary, Lafree and Laura Dugan note that 2014's violent peak notably has the highest number of fatalities since, since the start of the Global War on Terrorism database, which was fueled in large part by the rise of the Islamic State, which accounted for five of the deadliest 20 attacks over the 1970 to 2014 data set. Moreover, while ISIS's physical caliphate has been overcome by military operations, between 2018 and 2019, while the caliphate was shrinking, the group's global influence was expanding geographically, with over 56 countries now having the dubious honor of experiencing Islamic State-related terrorist attacks. Lafree and others are now cautiously optimistic, noting in early 2019 that the previous 36 months had seen the largest three-year decline in attacks and fatalities in the history of the data set. But that does not change the fact that we are still in a new normal of historically high level of incidents and fatalities globally, driven largely by the proliferation of the Salafi jihadist groups we talked about at the beginning. The mission and the hope of my colleagues is to ensure that those trend lines continue to fall. That leaves us with a clear assessment of capability. The persistent lethal threat po posed by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and affiliated Salafi jihadist organizations is still prevalent as the US enters the third decade of the global war on terror. 
Despite the focus of multiple presidential administrations, the application of four successive na national counterterrorism strategies, and the elaborate targeting of foreign terrorist organizations by US and allied military and intelligence operations. The proliferation of affiliated groups and networks under Salafi jihadist banners has simply metastasized since 2001, leading to more aspiring fighters in more organizations in more places than at any point since the end of the Af Soviet Afghan conflict. That counterintuitive reality illustrates the need for rigorous quantitative and qualitative evaluation of the outcomes generated by US counterterrorism policy since September 11, 2001, which is the subject of my current research, and a more thorough assessment of the changes with, within individual groups' capability, intent, and strategy, which Mary so brilliantly explained in the beginning, over time, in reaction to US operations and as a result of their own independent thinking. We have to know our enemy. That leads me to intentions. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and their affiliates are deliberately opaque, adaptable, and opportunistic. Unlike my two-year-old, modern terrorists, and particularly Salafi jihadists, deliberately subvert their intentions, as Dr. Hoffman explains so eloquently in the third edition of Inside Terrorism. I realize at first blush this assertion may seem out of place. After all, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and their compatriots have elaborate and sophisticated propaganda clearly outlining their murderous intentions. But bombastic rhetoric and glossy propaganda is different than actual terrorist plots that pose a threat to the US and allied targets. In order to be operationally successful, Salafi jihadists must subvert their intended targets and operational strategy. This leads to the aforementioned crisis group and others' criticisms of the CIS counting of Salafi jihadists, namely that not all Salafi jihadist groups are intent on targeting the West. Some are content to target closer to home, which Seth Jones acknowledges in the introduction of the report by saying that not all the groups and fighters counted in his exhaustive study are plotting attacks against the US or other Western countries. This lack of clarity on intent and changes to intent by the groups themselves leads to understandable debate and differences in the analytic interpretation for any particular group, the focus on the near versus the far enemy, the strategic and operational focus of their chosen targets, the threat posed by foreign fighters and returnees. All of those are perceptions of intent. These analytic assessments, which have been debated and discussed in similar terms with Al-Qaeda, are now largely focused on ISIS and are particularly conflicted over the future of Salafi jihadism after the fall of the caliphate, the next step for ISIS fighters after President Trump's decision to withdraw forces from Syria and Turkey's subsequent incursion on the Kurds. It is certainly possible, and indeed likely, as Colin Clark argued in an October 2019 RAND commentary, that the US withdrawal from Syria could provide a boost to ISIS, particularly given the reported prison breaks and missing key figures in late 2019. However, I hate to end on a terrible note, so it is worth highlighting that thus far, the feared for threats of attacks from foreign fighter returnees from Iraq and Syria have not materialized in the way that was originally anticipated, at least in part due to the tendency of ISIS fighters who travel to Syria either to not view themselves as domestic terrorists wishing to necessarily return to their homeland and attack, or due to their simple failure to return at all due to death or capture on the battlefield. That is not necessarily an immutable reality, however, and we cannot take our eye off the ball. Al-Qaeda and ISIS and their affiliates are playing a long game a multi-generational struggle against the West, and their intentions will adapt to operationalize jihad without the caliphate. Indeed, our global counterterrorism efforts will also have to adapt. Um, we had a wonderful discussion this morning about how technology is fueling much of that, that adaptation. There are already promising indications of that adaptation. Interpol has developed a widely reported database including over 19,000 Islamic State fighter information, including passports and biometric data detailing detailing the individuals of concern for border security and law enforcement. That's an excellent step in the right direction, but chillingly, despite the focus on the number of individuals that the United States and our allies have allegedly removed from the battlefield um, in Iraq and Syria, Brett McGurk, at the end of his tenure as a special advisor to defeat ISIS, pointed out that the vast majority of that 19,000 list was still alive. That's where the true danger of the Salafi jihadist threat lies. No matter how you count the numbers, we're faced with a historically high number of capable organizations with record numbers of fighters geographically dispersed in more places in the world than at any point in the last 20 years, whose specific intentions are opaque and adaptable, but consistently, strategically gravitate towards targeting the West and its allies at any opportunity. The task ahead, to quote another US luminary, Thomas Jefferson, so aptly put, requires eternal vigilance. While bin Laden, Baghdadi, and the ISIS Caliphate are gone, their influence, and indeed their geographic reach, remains and will continue to persist long after today to threaten the US and our allies. The question for us all is will we have the resiliency to continue to aggressively counter that threat while taking critical stock of the last two decades to improve both our methods and our efficiency? <laughs>
Mary, Amy, thank you very much indeed for two excellent talks. We're going, as before in the earlier session, to take a group of questions, three at a time. We've got microphones, I think, which will go round, and then we'll give each speaker a chance to respond. And there may be some discussion between the speakers on the things that they have raised as well. So who'll start us off with the first question? Question there towards the back, the gentleman there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so from a lay, like a self-educated lay perspective, over the last decade, it seems like Salafism's experienced a change in motivations and goals between Boko Haram, Yemen, ISIS. Can you speak to the um, continued element, the role that Zionism or cynical manipulation of Zionism by Salafist leaders continues to play, if any, in militant Salafism? Has it waxed or waned? And also briefly, um, to what extent are, is American counterinsurgency effort still um, informed by 20th century Latin American experiences as in Cuba and Colombia? Thank you. Then there's a question down here at the front if the microphone could come. Donald, yes. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you very much, uh, Donald Holbrook, St. Andrews University. It's a question, I guess, to both speakers, and it's about that kind of fluffier domain of the third part of the definition of what Al-Qaeda looked like, the sort of the, 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 the grassroots element that consists of fans, for want of a better term. So, so I wondered if you could speak to the, and actually Amy came to this at the, at the end of your talk about influence, and about what the relationship between a grassroots, whatever that looks like, and the hierarchy, which is more by intelligent design, looks like and what an insurgent organization looks like when it's operating in areas where there is no insurgency. Just if you could speak a little bit about that, that would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. There's a question right at the front here from Bruce Hoffman. There we go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you both for excellent presentations. What was conspicuous from both discussions is no one mentioned Al-Qaeda's famous seven-phase plan that Saif al presented to bin Laden in 2005, so I'd be curious of your assessment. Is that plan still part of the Minhaj? Is it still operable? And if so, what phase are they at now? And what might we expect in the 2020s? Thank you, so three good questions. Mary first and then Amy. Mary. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think I can address the role of Zionism, at least when it comes to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, be, ISIS before they broke away. Um, so um, Al-Qaeda actually, uh, Saif al uh, put out a document in 2002 during the uh, first reform period of um, al-Qaeda. Um, after nine, the, the abject failure of 9-11, they went through a, a reform process. Is that still on? Oh, okay. Went through a reform process and um, a whole series of documents were put out and, uh, explaining how we're going to have to change the Minhaj and um, our ideology in order to deal with these uh, new problems that have arisen. And he was very clear that the main enemy is the Jews, not Zionism, the Jews. And by the way, during the 1990s, every single document we have from Abbottabad, they uh, name the Jews, full stop, as being the enemy, not Zionism or Israel. And they intend to carry out genocide. They have said it, they intend to do it. They intend to kill every single Jewish person in the entire world, as well as every Hindu that does not convert, um, every atheist who doesn't uh, convert, every, they have an entire range of people they intend to carry out genocide, and ISIS actually attempted to do it and was very open about it, which is the only thing they got criticized for by uh, Zawahiri back in 2005. He said, if you're gonna kill somebody, don't you know, make a big scene about it, take them out back and shoot them in the head. He did not say, you know, don't kill people. He said, just don't tell people you're doing it. So I assume that Al-Qaeda affiliates have mass graves all over the place based on that. Anyway, then um, uh, adherence, I think I'm gonna leave this for you and talking about, but safe a lot. Uh, that seven, okay, so uh, the Minhaj, as far as I can tell from the documents, started off as a three or four stage um, sort of, um, uh, plan, strategic, grand strategic plan, but based on the life of Muhammad, as I said. Uh, the names are based on his life. So there was the Mecca, uh, Hijra, Medina, and Mecca stages. Um, but overlaid with it, right from the start, were four, those four stages from Mao. Um, the covert jihad was uh, Mecca, and so on and so forth. You can just lay them right over the top of it. Um, by the mid 
1990s. It had evolved into a five stage, then apparently a six stage. I haven't seen a document with the six stage, but um, Safe Al Adel had a seven stage, and the Abbottabad documents from the time also suggest a seven stage plan with different names, again, taken from the life of Muhammad. And now the, the four stages for the military strategic or military political side of things fits kind of unevenly over them, like halfway through this when you're going to halfway through this when you're going to end up doing this. And it becomes apparent that um, the um, legitimacy problem, making this all um, nice and legal, uh, the, the lawyer problem, was being dealt with um, by simply kind of ignoring it and just having the uh, putting over the top of it what they knew worked. And so this seven stage plan until at least very recently, as far as I can tell, was still what they were working on. He just didn't give the actual names that we see in the Abbottabad documents for the same thing. And this is uh, the important part about this. The third stage of the military political side of things is supposed to be equilibrium and equilibrium is specifically described in the documents that we have from Abbottabad, you are not supposed to attack the central government. You're in fact supposed to leave them alone because you're gonna focus on creating governance. And one of the things that happened in the reform process in 2002, please forgive me for going on and on, is they um, globalized what had been a local uh, vision. So the original vision was, you're going to carry this out against what they called the uh, Tawarit, which is the, um, the evil leaders of all of these countries. That was the original focus of Al-Qaeda. And, uh, and their Minhaj, the cover page for the Minhaj says, for the jihad with the Tawarit. It did not say for the jihad against the Jewish crusaders, which, it, which is not a mistranslation because the crusaders are puppets of the Jews. So the, the Minhaj was directed against the Tawarit, and the United States was seen as an irritant that had to be gotten rid of in order to proceed with the Minhaj. They never used the term far enemy, um, near enemy, in order to talk about this part of the, of the Minhaj. This is like, get rid of the United States and force them to leave our country. But after the United States showed up in force in Afghanistan, they had to go through this reform process in which they, uh, the argument was made that you have to globalize this and consider the international Nizam, which means regime as well as system needs to be considered as one government, being run by the Jews, of course. And the international system has its headquarters in Washington, DC, and it has provinces across the Middle East and elsewhere. And you will therefore consider putting the entire system through the same minhaj. And it needs to go through, first, the covert jihad, then it has to go through um, a strategic offensive in which you attempted to bleed the United States in various wars and inveigle the United States in various wars. And when the United States chose to leave in 2011, Everything suggests from the public documents, we don't have, you know, the, the Abbottabad documents only go up to a certain point, suggests that they declared the equilibrium had broken out. And therefore, you don't carry out attacks against the United States in Europe or elsewhere. You're, you're focused on creating governance on a global scale, right? And said, and the lo but the local um, minhaj is still going forward. Everybody's at a different stage depending on the um, al Khalid. Thank you, Mary. Amy. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the, how much of our current tactics are, are informed by Latin American experience, because I think the other one you, you handled quite, quite well. Um, I think it's, it's well known that 3-24, the counterinsurgency manual for the US Army, was, was largely developed by individuals that had experience, um, either academic or on the ground, from the Vietnam War. Right? I think that's probably more of a, a comparison to draw from. Um, and as far as a, an, a detailed study of what it takes to conduct a counterinsurgency, there is arguably no better book, right? Um, the, the problem is, I think, as, as Mary and I both alluded to, it's resource intensive, right? It's incredibly resource intensive. Um, and so the difficulty that, um, that I think our, our policymakers have is how do you balance um, that resource intensive need with the kind of global threat we both talked about today? Um, and that's something that almost any counterinsurgency um, menu or lesson won't necessarily teach you because they're by and large not operating on a global scale. They're by and large operating in a single country or location um, and not on the kind of scale that Mary and I talked about um, this morning. In terms of the grassroots element um, and affiliates, I think sometimes we overestimate the importance of the command and control part of terrorist attacks, right? Um, an individual stealing a lorry and driving over um, people in Western Europe is just as disruptive many times to society um, as, a, as an attack 
orchestrated um, by Al Qaeda or ISIS. Um, in fact, both groups have argued they're more effective, right? For a number of reasons. They're cheaper for the organization, right? Um, they don't have to expose themselves um, to law enforcement intelligence or otherwise if they have a willing aspirant who's, who's willing to pick up a gun or shoot up a mall or steal a vehicle and drive over a populace. Um, so they don't have to expose themselves or come out of hiding to get that. They also get the same bang for their buck in terms of the local disruption and potential overreaction by local security forces. And as a further bonus, they can then claim it in their propaganda and literature as a soldier of their state. Right? So that's a win-win for everybody involved. From the soldier's perspective um, of, the, of the jihad, it's a win for them because it, whether they, they live or die in the attack, they have pledged visibly their affiliation for this organization. Right? They become part of the global vanguard. So there's an interaction between the propaganda and the aspirants um, that I'm very concerned about whether or not Zawahiri ordered an attack or Adnani ordered an attack or Baghdadi back in the day ordered an attack. Um, because I don't think it takes that to actually disrupt our societies or, as we've proven, to kill a lot of people. Um, and so the, the aspirant problem, I think, is one that we, we don't pay um, enough credence to in saying it, it actually matters to a certain extent how much you're getting direction from abroad um, give, to measure the reach of the organization and their capacity to execute operations from that core that Mary talked about. But from a counterterrorist state perspective, you can do just, just as much damage if you've never talked to Zawahiri. right? Um, and we forget that people like KSM were actually jihadist entrepreneurs, right? We think about them as the mastermind of 9-11, but it was, he was really, a, this is oversimplifying it, but an entrepreneur who brought an idea to a wealthy guy who could fund it, right? Um, and so Al-Qaeda and ISIS are both, and their affiliate organizations, looking for good ideas from bright guys that they can fund or support. And that's not gonna stop. And that's where the danger lies in the numbers that I talked about. Because with that kind of population, you're talking about a lot of potential guys and gals, in some cases, with some good ideas for jihad. Um, and all it takes is one or two. Thank you, Amy. Next question. There's one there towards the back, a gentleman. Thank you. Here comes the microphone. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, how you doing? I'm Pal Srikachorn. I'm a uh, CT analyst uh, in and around the DMV area. Uh, my question is, um, so there's been a, a mention of an increase in Al-Qaeda Al core membership and a significant uh, increase in Salafi jihadi groups, 200-300% uh, since 2011. Um, how much of those statistics are based on, one, the power vacuum created by Operation Neptune Spear and the killing of Osama bin Laden, um, a decentralized structure encouraged by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi versus a centralized structure that seemed to be more an Al-Qaeda uh, theme? And then also, does the increase in groups, uh, in Salafi jihadi groups, correlate to the lethality of the terrorism? Um, in other words, does the enthusiasm of Salafi jihadis, um, does, it, does it match the capability of these Salafi jihadi groups? Thanks. Thank you. Next question. There's one there just next to him. Uh, yep. Gentleman there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. The 2019 Global Terrorism Index says that the four groups most responsible for terrorist-related death over the previous year are the Taliban, um, Daesh, the Khorasan faction of Daesh, and Boko Haram. And yet the Western-driven mainstream media is promoting an ulterior message that terrorism is not Islamist born, is not jihadist driven, yet those four main groups are in fact jihadist groups. So my question is to what degree does promoting those particular facts across the populace or across organizations or institutions that are doing CT research and CT missions impact the success or failure of the CT mission itself? Thank you very much. Another question? Tied to this round? Okay, yes, there's a gentleman there. Thank you very much. We'll take this one and I'll give the speakers a chance to respond. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jay Serrano. I'm a student here at Georgetown. And I was wondering, with the leadership removal of al Baghdadi and bin Laden in the last decade, how much has the capability of the groups reduced, even as they've added more members? Thank you. So I'll start with Amy and then have Mary afterwards this time. Okay. Amy? Um, I'll defer the centralized structure um, and the internal networks to, to Mary. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, the 
enthusiasm versus the capability piece, because that was a, a part of my talk. Um, I think it depends, which I realize is, is the worst kind of academic answer. Um, but I painted a, a pretty broad brushstroke over 45 different groups that have varying capabilities, um, depending on which particular individual you're talking about. Um, it, I, I will turn to my earlier comment, which is a committed individual inspired by Adnani, Baghdadi, Bin Laden, Saifel, Adel, take your pick, um, who is enterprising, can do a tremendous amount of damage. Is that damage more or less than a command orchestrated plot um, with box cutters? Um, I, think we, I think we've seen statistically, it seems to be less, um, but that doesn't mean that an inspired group with box cutters couldn't do the same exact thing, right? Um, we presuppose that the organizational structure gave them the capability to do that attack, but in reality, they were years separated in some cases and at least months from that central structure to develop an independent cell to develop the attack on 9-11. So, we assume constant communication back to a leadership network that is important, but whose day-to-day -day management of the organization, we found out after the Abbottabad raid, was not as clear as we once thought, right? There was still day-to-day -day management, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of obsessive, you have not paid this bill, or how many, counter, how many fighters do we have in this count today, or are we going to rename our organization, right? There was a lot of, um, for lack of a better term, bureaucratic hand-wringing about managing the organization. But that's different than direct, immediate, day-to-day -day operational control. Um, and even when you're talking about terrorist organization directed plotting, the assumption that I think is embedded in that is there's direct operational control that says, go here, shoot up this location, and report back. And that's not the way Al-Qaeda traditionally has implemented command and control, right? That's, that's a, I think, our conception of what that looks like, not theirs. Um, and that's where these aspiring individuals to attack on their behalf um, is absolutely okay, and in some cases preferred. Same with ISIS. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about the, the second question in terms of the um, Taliban Daesh, the Khorasan group at Boko Haram, and what degree to do, does promoting facts matter? Um, I think it matters a lot, right? Um, there's, there's a part of me that as a CT practitioner is perfectly happy the less time we spend talking about it on the news, right? Um, it should be, in, in many ways, the, the problem of academics and professionals, and um, my family members should be content to go on the metro and not think about the things I think about for a living, right? On another level, um, as an academic and a practitioner, it's important to ground what we do in quantitative statistical reality, right? Um, and so the 2019 numbers you, you mentioned are from the START Terrorism Database I'm working to do my research on. You know, I wrote a proposal and the US government is funding me to research um, exactly what our impact has been on these groups over time. Those are questions that are valid and worth asking. Um, so I think promoting facts matters. It's, it's a matter of how much we talk about it and in what context. Because you have to remember that the purpose of terrorism is to, is to spark, in addition to a reaction um, and, a, and a movement, is to spark fear, right? So there is a certain health to saying, let's not fear something that statistically happens less often than an automobile accident, mm -hmm. right? That's healthy for a Western liberal democracy. But when we do talk about terrorism, we need to talk about it grounded in operational facts, either from the organizations we study and their perspective on the threat, or from the things we can quantify based on research. Thank you, Amy. Mary. Uh, so I, I might need some clarity here about the very first question. The rise of numbers and groups, does this mean a decline in Al Qaeda core? Is that what you were asking? Um, no, I was uh, mentioning, so there was a, a statistic that was thrown out that since 2011, I think there was a 2018 or 2017 number that there was a huge increase in Salafi jihadi groups across the yeah. globe. Well, that um, yeah. Is that mainly due to an enthusiastic amount of people that are like, hey, look, we're going to do things due to a decentralized command from ISIS mm -hmm. and a, basically a power vacuum after they lost kind of like their big, uh, you yeah. know, their, their big leader in, in, in Bin Laden? Yeah, uh, so to me, the, uh, when you look at how Al-Qaeda itself reacted to the death of bin Laden, they reacted to it actually by quoting something that was said uh, after the death of Muhammad, which was, uh, Muhammad is dead, but God is alive. And so to them, there, this was nothing. They had um, apparently a 40-day period of mourning. Then um, everybody swore their oaths of uh, bayat uh, to Zawahri, 
and the hierarchy flexed and just went on. And uh, the growth in the numbers uh, of the violence after this event occurred is um, kind of speaks for itself, as it were, about their growth in intent and capabilities, right? Capabilities especially. Um, but there's actually something contradictory. Um, maybe those of you who are listening you know, picked up on this contradiction here between us because uh, there's been a decline in violence since 2014, right? Yep. Um, even while there's been a growth in these groups and a spread of insurgency to lots of different countries that weren't afflicted with this beforehand. So what in the world does that mean, right? That, that contradiction actually one of the ways you can understand it is um, through uh, looking at these uh, at insurgencies in general when they control territory versus when territory is being contested. So if you take a look at what happened in Iraq, um, before the United States started the surge, violence was actually had actually kind of reached an equilibrium. It, it was almost it had gotten kind of flat. Uh, by the time you get to the end of 20, uh, 2006. But when the United States began the surge, violence just spiked, went right through the roof, highest we've ever seen. And there were areas that were completely quiet and calm that all of a sudden you had a tremendous amount of violence. So the way it's generally understood by military historians is, or military experts is, they controlled the, ter uh, the terrain, the territory, and the people within it, and they didn't need to carry out anything, any uh, uh, attacks. But the minute the United States began to contest them, or a government starts to contest them, then you see what's really going on there. You don't actually know what's going on when there's no violence in an insurgency. It could be the insurgents are not present, or it could be they're simply so in control they don't have to use violence at all in order to achieve what they want to achieve. So there is lots of places that are now quiescent, where people are like, oh, there used to be a lot of violence in Pakistan. And suddenly there's no violence hardly at all in Pakistan. It's one of the places where there's been a tremendous drop. Well, from the Abbottabad documents, we know that in, for years previous to 2011, they were engaged in negotiations with the Pakistani government and with local governance as well to come to some understanding. You don't poke us, and we won't poke you. So we have no idea how much control uh, jihadi Salafists have in Pakistan, none. And the same thing is true across a lot of Africa. Mauritania, uh, Mauritania should have a lot of violence, given the number of people who have some sort of allegiance to um, uh, jihadi Salafism, but there's hardly any. So uh, we can't really tell what they're doing. Uh, because we haven't poked them. Well, we won't find out until you put boots on the ground. I call it the puppet master problem. There's my, one of my favorite books by Robert Heinlein. Uh, when the uh, aliens took over, everything got dark. There was no communication out. Everything looked peaceful. Everything's just fine. It was only when the United States tried to put people on the ground to contest the aliens that suddenly you have, oh, they actually controlled everybody in the entire place. And this, I think, was going on here. OK. so. Another question was about whether this terrorism is jihadist or not. And it's like uh, the term um, Islamic or jihadist has sort of uh, gone away as a term of art that's used by most um, experts. Um, um, it began, obviously, during the Obama administration, who wanted to use violent extremism to talk both about right-wing violence as well as um, jihadi Salafism. So you, you just kind of get rid of. Um, the term Islamic, so you can kind of lump together a lot of different kinds of violence in one place. And, um, but uh, these guys claim to uh, be Muslims. They claim to have some sort of relationship with Islam. Um, and in fact, much of what they're doing is, suggests they want to co-opt Islam for their own purposes. I call them a death cult. So they have, um, they have one tiny narrow line of interpretation. Um, through the Sahwa Salafism uh, group and the Muslim Brotherhood as understood by Qutb and then back to um, Ibn Abdul Wahhab and then further back to a guy named Ibn Taymiyyah and that's it. And basically it starts in about 1200, the, the basic interpretive line that they have with Islam and that's it. It doesn't go further back than that and they don't quote people from further back um, in any depth. They don't uh, believe that they represent uh, 
real Islam, as they put it. And their attempt is to co-opt Islam and force Muslims first into their version of the Sharia, which is absolutely positively unique. And since Islam is mostly about orthopraxy uh, rather than orthodoxy, how people act is what you actually um, base uh, their, their views of the religion on. And they're forcing an awful lot, and this is what I would use actually, instead of violence in order to understand their influence. How many people in the world are being forced to follow their very, very unique version um, of Islam? Um, so then the, an interesting conversation, please forgive me, can I address something she said or should in, I eat in, in 90 seconds. Uh, I, don't, I don't know I'm if I've ever said Mary. anything in 90 seconds. Oh, yeah, so um, the, the problem of the problem of command and control in irregular warfare is really fascinating and I'm really interested in it. But what you see actually with Al Qaeda from the Abbottabad documents and what happened since ISIS is an attempt to have more command and control rather than less. So they started off very loosey goosey in the 1990s. 9 11 was kind of like, well, we need a little more, and then they start creating these groups, right? This is the, the creation of Bayat as a way of controlling these groups, and everybody has to join up and swear the oath, and then you're in the hierarchy. And then with um, Zar, uh, Zar Khawi going off and doing his own thing, they had to have a little more. Then with, um, and especially got really, really important when ISIS broke away. They were not going to have that happen again. And we have a public document from uh, the head of uh, AQIS describing six different ways uh, that Al-Qaeda's Central Command was enforcing their will on a global basis across all of these groups and that are new um, since the, the rise of ISIS. And I, just to build on that, the, the enforcing the view, I think, is categorically different than the way I answered the original question, which is command and control mm. for specific attacks, right? But Al Qaeda, make no mistake, and ISIS are obsessive with how they control their affiliates and their provinces. And we see that largely in captured documents. Yes. And then they leave the affiliates, then, are like, you know, the COCOMs. You don't have the yeah. president or the secretary of defense telling, you know, CENTCOM how he, they should do their business, right? We've had another excellent session. And bringing it to a close, three very brief comments um, from me to clarify what's going to happen. The first is something that Amy reminded me of when she inadvertently compared her two-year-old to a terrorist. Uh, and I remember when our daughters were young, it was around the time of the war in Afghanistan. And I rather modelled our house on the Afghan campaign in the sense that initially we wanted control of the whole country. And you'd hear violence upstairs and you'd go and deal with it. Uh, after a while, you realise this was an exaggerated sense of the effectiveness of counterterrorism. And as long as you could have a bottle of wine in the green zone downstairs, uh, the, the suicide attacks could happen in the bathroom. And it was kind of OK. So um, a, a second point. Um, we're now going to break for lunch, and after that lunch, Tim Wilson is going to introduce our keynote lecture from Jonathan Evans, and I very much hope you'll all be around for that excellent opportunity as well. But most importantly, in concluding this session, uh, for wonderful talks and for very insightful and sharp-sighted responses to questions and discussion, please join me in thanking Mary Haybeck and Amy Stern. Thank you.